Hey, good morning here. We're going to talk about the 19, not the 1950s, but the 1850s. And we're going to talk about uh, sectional conflict and what's going on in the, the country. Um, and to start talking about the 1850s, I'm really going back to 1846, so I lied. We're talking about the 1840s all the way to uh, basically Civil War this week. Now, there's this event called the Wilmot Proviso. Uh, this is going to be a discussion about what to do with the land that the United States wins from Mexico. Uh, this is called the Mexican Cession, C-E-S-S-I-O-N. Uh, that's the territory that we win from Mexico. And that's going to be parts of what's going to become California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. So it's a big amount of territory that we have to figure out what to do with. And the biggest question is, will this land be a free territory or will it be slave territory? That's kind of like the million dollar question I want to do. And the Wilmot Proviso is supposed to solve that. Uh, there's this guy named David Wilmot. He's a Democrat from Pennsylvania. He introduces legislation to Congress to prohibit slavery in any territory that is acquired from Mexico. Uh, ultimately, it's rejected, but it's going to rekindle and restart the talk of slavery. Um, <clears throat> it's basically going to be introduced every year from 1846 to 1850, and it's never going to pass. It usually passes the House of Representatives because that is based on population. The northern states had more population than the southern states, but it would fail in the Senate because the Senate, two senators per state, no matter what, and at this time there were 15 slave states, 15 free states. So any ties would fail. Uh, the Whig Party, what we talked about previously, it's going to split over what to do here. Some Whigs are going to favor slavery, some Whigs do not, and that's going to lead to the demise of the Whig Party and the rise of a new party. It's also, uh, the Wilmot Proviso is going to create this idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, basically, it's this idea of let the territories decide on their own, whether they want to be free, whether they want to be slave, everything is going to be based on popular vote. And it looks like a good solution, but it's actually going to make everything else worth worse. Uh, Northerners thought that people would choose freedom, Southerners thought that people would choose slavery, and all along they were trying to keep this balance between slave and free and try to keep it equal. So that's what it looks like going into the 1950s. Uh, abolition is becoming more radicalized. Uh, some famous books such as Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe have come out. Frederick Douglass, the former slave, has escaped and is promoting anti-slavery throughout the country. Then you have people like James Sterling saying, hey, slavery is okay. You have George Fitzhugh, cannibals all saying slavery is great. So there's this real, real big debate going on over slavery as well. And slavery is going to become the number one debated item now that Manifest Destiny is kind of in the background. Uh, Education is put under the rug. Women's suffrage and the right to vote is put under the rug. Temperance and anti-alcohol, people forget about that. Slavery becomes the number one debated item in the 1850s. And then I told you there's a new political party. It's called the Free Soil Party and they're meaning no slavery. Uh, Martin Van Buren, the former president, he is going to become the leader of this. There are anti-slavery Whigs, anti-slavery Democrats, and the Free Soil Party is going to become a force in what's going on in the 1850s. Uh, bottom left, that's from a political campaign rally. You can see Martin Van Buren, and uh, he's gonna run for president again and Charles Adams is his vice presidential candidate. All right, the election of 1848, just going back in time a little bit. In 1848, the Democratic Party is going to nominate a guy named Lewis Cass. He's from Michigan. He's all about popular sovereignty, let the people choose their own adventure, so to speak. Uh, the Whig Party is going to nominate Zachary Taylor. Uh, Zachary Taylor is a Southerner. But Zachary Taylor, he tries to avoid talking about slavery at all, even though he's a Southerner, everybody knows he's from the South, 
But Zachary Taylor says, hey, vote for me. I'm a war hero. I don't know anything about slavery. I'm a war hero. Vote for me. And the Free Soil Party is going to come out. They're going to nominate Martin Van Buren for the first time. And Martin Van Buren is going to be, of course, anti-slavery. Now, down at the bottom, you can see how the election of 1848 plays out. Um, Zachary Taylor and his vice presidential nominee, Millard Fillmore, get 163 uh, electoral college votes. Lewis Cass, the Democrat's going to get 127. And then Martin Van Buren, he gets zero. Womp womp. But he does get almost 300,000 votes. And a lot of people think that if he hadn't run and those 300,000 votes had gone to the Democratic Party, they may have won this. But in the end, the Whig Party wins. Zachary Taylor becomes president. Um, however, Zachary Taylor, he doesn't last very long. He dies just a few days after inauguration. Uh, he gets to be president for less than a week. Uh, Taylor dies of a gastrointestinal affliction. Basically, he dies of food poisoning. But there were questions that he was poisoned. Questions to the point that he was exhumed. His body was dug up about 10 years ago and they conducted tests on him to prove he wasn't poisoned. And by the way, he was not. It was confirmed to be food poisoning. But Millard Fillmore is going to become the vice president. Millard Fillmore is going to get an upgrade to president. And Millard Fillmore and his presidential cabinet didn't like each other very much. Uh, because Zachary Taylor was from the South, most of the people he appointed to his cabinet were from the South. Millard Fillmore was from the North. All right, California. Uh, you've got the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that was signed in 1848 that gave California to the United States. Massive numbers of people flow to California using the California tra uh, Trail in 1848, 1849. Gold is discovered in 1849. Even more people come to California. By the time we get to 1850, California is ready to become a state. And the people in California, the white settlers of California, they opposed slavery. They didn't oppose slavery because of moral grounds. They didn't think that slavery was wrong, but they feared competition. So white settlers wanted to keep as many people out of California as they could, whether they be free, slave, or something in between. Now, entry into the country as a free, slave, uh, free state uh, instead of a slave state would upset the balance because at that time there were 15 slave, 15 free. So uh, this old guy, Henry Clay, uh, he was a senator still kicking around uh, from Kentucky. Uh, we talked about him way back with John Adams. We talked about him with the America First platform from the early 1800s. Well, he's still around in 1850. He's just really, really old. And he proposes this compromise. He says, okay, let's let California in as a free state. Let's pay Mexico for the boundary of Texas and get them off our back. Let's create the territory of New Mexico. Let's get rid of slavery in Washington, D.C. And then let's make the Fugitive Slave Act even stronger. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act, that gave slave hunters permission to go anywhere in the country find a slave and return them to their owner. Now this gave people a lot of power. Um, slavery basically spread all throughout the country whether you lived in a free state or a slave state. It didn't matter because anybody could be returned to slavery. You could have somebody living in a cabin in the state of Maine in the woods next door to the Canadian border with a moose as a pet and if they were accused of being a fugitive slave they could be arrested and sent back to the south. Now this compromise that Henry Clay develops is going to become known as the Compromise of 1850 and it's the idea behind it is it's going to keep the balance everybody gets something California will become a free state. Slavery is gone from Washington, D.C. 
the fugitive slave act will protect slave owners and new mexico could possibly become a slave territory based on popular sovereignty but in reality nobody is actually satisfied with this compromise S uh, people in the south feel like they have given up the future because um, it was believed that all of the new territories would end up being free territories very few slave owners were willing to pay for the expense of sending agents north to recapture runaway slaves that was an expensive undertaking and then in the north um, anti-slavery people were critical of the fugitive slave law they were afraid that free blacks might be kidnapped and enslaved fraudulently and if you've ever seen uh, 12 years a slave you can see that happening uh, so in reality this compromise of 1850 kind of hurt things more than it helped now we also have this event called bleeding kansas and usually if something's got the word bleeding in it it's probably not a good thing and that's very true here in the late 1840s there are enough settlers in kansas and nebraska that the united states government needs to create an organized territory meaning a territory with an official government uh, however both kansas and nebraska they're north of the missouri compromise line from 1820 meaning that slavery wasn't supposed to be allowed in either Kansas or Nebraska. But the Southern government officials wanted slavery to be allowed there, and so did Southern people. Um, so there was this real big argument, and this guy who's going to become important, his name is Stephen Douglas. He is a senator from the state of Illinois. Uh, he's going to come up with this idea of popular sovereignty. and. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 is going to split Kansas and Nebraska into two territories. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 is going to allow both Kansas and Nebraska to use popular sovereignty to choose whether they're going to be a slave territory or a free territory. Now, when this announcement is made, people from both the North and the South are going to rush to Kansas so that they can set up residence before any votes are taken on what their government's going to look like and what the condition is going to be slave or free. Uh, the people of Kansas did not wait though. Uh, there is a government set up even though it's not supposed to be. It's set up by southern settlers and Kansas is going to adopt the Missouri Slave Code even though no uh, no no votes have been taken now the Missouri slave code uh, there were severe penalties against anyone who spoke against slaveholding there were severe penalties against anyone who wrote about slavery um, anybody who assisted fugitives would be put to death anybody who helped slaves escape would be sentenced to 10 years of hard labor and that is the law that Kansas put into place the same one Missouri was using Northern settlers and northern government officials were completely outraged by this and they set up a competing government. So we have one territory, we have two different governments that doesn't work. Um, on May 21st, 1856, there's this group of pro-slavery men who enter the capital of Kansas. At the time, the capital was Lawrence, Kansas. Um, they burned down something called the Free State Hotel, they destroyed printing presses, they destroyed homes and stores, and then in retaliation, uh, this anti-slavery abolitionist, his name is John Brown, he's going to lead this attack at a place called Potawatomi Creek, and pro-slavery men are going to be dragged from their homes and these pro-slavery men are going to be hacked to death and this is going to lead to this, a wave of violence it's basically going to be a miniature war that happens inside kansas uh, this violence even goes all the way to washington dc and goes to congress itself uh, there is a senator from massachusetts named charles sumner he gives a speech in congress called the crime against kansas 
that is a live link that you can click on if you want to read it. It's pretty long, but it, it is interesting. But that's optional. Um, he accuses pro-slavery senators of of encouraging the violence in Kansas and encouraging Kansas to break the law. And in retaliation, there's this congressman from South Carolina named Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks is going to break into the Senate chamber, go up to Charles Sumner and beat him senseless with his cane. It's, it's just a crazy time. Finally, in 1856, there's a new territorial governor. His name is John Geary. He's appointed governor, and he is sent to the territory of Kansas, and he restores order. By the time order is restored, somewhere between 50 and 75 people have been killed. Now, there still is the question of the Constitution. Uh, there is something, there's a pro-slavery constitution called the Lecompton Constitution. It's ratified in 1857 after an election that a lot of people thought was not fair. Um, voters were given a choice between either unlimited slavery or limited slavery. There was no option for no slavery. So anti-slavery people boycotted the election. Anti-slavery people refused to cast ballots. The guy who was president in 1857, his name is James Buchanan, we'll talk about him on Thursday, but he urges Congress to admit Kansas as a slave state. Uh, James Buchanan says, this all looks legit to me. Well, a lot of senators, including Stephen Douglas, say, no, this is not right. And the bill to allow Kansas to become a state does not pass. In an election in Kansas in August of 1858, the Lecompton Constitution is thrown out. And there has to be another election, another constitution in July of 1859. That one is the final constitution. It's an anti-slavery constitution. Now, the pro-slave people don't give up. They're still fighting in Kansas, and they're still fighting the government on whether Kansas will be allowed as a state or not. The only reason Kansas is allowed to become a state is in 1861 when all the Confederate states secede, when they leave the United States, there's nobody to stop the northern states from allowing Kansas in. So Kansas is going to be admitted to a state as a state in 1861 after the Confederate states leave. All right, so just a couple last things here. First of all, Secret word of the day is going to be museum. Why is museum the secret word of the day? Well, it's because the museum reviews are coming due soon. Now, remember, you cannot actually go to a museum anymore because, well, coronavirus. But you can still look at those virtual museums that I gave you in Blackboard. If you don't want to do a virtual museum, remember, you can do a historical film as well. Both of those will count as your museum review. Uh, however, if you did go to a museum already, go ahead and write about the museum that you did see. I don't want you to have to do it again. But what else do you have to do? I mean, we're stuck at home almost every day. So go ahead while you're social distancing. Just get the work out of the way. Work smarter, not harder. Uh, the last thing I want to remind you of is the SLO essay. Yes, I had your rough draft. Some of you have already gotten your rough draft feedback already. Um, whether you've gotten feedback yet or not, go ahead and continue working on that. So once again, social distancing, you don't really have much to do. Work on it a little bit at a time. Make sure you give me footnotes, make sure you give me citations, make sure you give me the best possible work you can since it is 10% of your grade. All right, we'll see you soon. Have a good day. We'll talk to you on Thursday. Bye-bye.